Just before, before I start off, um, I should explain the tie. Um, I have to tell you that the main reason I wear a tie is that my wife says that I really look good in a tie. <laughs> she picked out this tie. And it becomes increasingly important as you lose your hair, you know, <laughs> that you have at least something that attracts your wife. So, and if anybody saw me back in the early 70s like Mel did, I used to have hair down to here and I really wanted my hair back. So, uh, you know, this was really important for me. So anyway, it has nothing, it has something to do with my job, but, you know, there's, yeah. okay, the other thing is, um, I, um, I can show this picture. This is the second storm. And it is true that I missed both storms. So um, this really hurt really bad. Um, I, was, I was actually with, is, uh, is Krish here? I was with Krishnamurti in India, and he saw my pain. So I actually left on the last plane before the first storm and arrived at Newark on the very first plane after they cleared the runway from the second storm. So my flights absolutely bracketed both storms. But that's what the World Weather Building looked like during the second storm. And this talk will have nothing about hurricanes other than the challenges that I think you face in terms of taking WARF and the DTC towards it. But I want to give a historic perspective on some of the forecast advancements that we're making. I'm here to declare WARF a success story. I don't know how many meetings I've been at in which somebody will say, um, well, why did war fail? Okay, and it was rough. I have to admit it's rough, but I think it's a success story, and we're going to build on that for the hurricane aspect. And uh, the current status, uh, spinning up the DTC, I think is a huge uh, advancement for us, and um, and NSEP is certainly committed to that in every shape, way, and form. Um, and the ongoing challenges that I think you'll be facing, and in a summary. Um, so from a historic perspective, what I want to do is I do want to focus on the success of forecasting the first of those two storms. Um, the increasing role of ensembles in the seamless suite of forecast products and the increasing requirement for multi-model ensembles, which is cutting across the entire spectrum of forecast applications. The one place we don't have a multi-model ensemble running operationally is in a hurricane application. So there's, you know, there's the number one clue in terms of moving forward. Um, and then um, the role of the Shreff and the Wharf highlighted for the recent forecast of extreme events. I'll show this one storm, but I'm hearing this more. I went to a couple of Air Force bases. Uh, Don, I reported back to you as soon as I got um, uh, out of the one in Arizona. And uh, all I hear about is Shreff, okay? And people are using more and more of this for, for uh, decision making. All right, so here's the uh, February 6th. Um, this is what it looked like um, in terms of the, the snow event. And what we have here are the watches and the warnings. And what's really remarkable is, you know, not only how far in advance the watches and warnings were, but we didn't, you know, blow them all the way up through New England like probably we would have done 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, the northern edge of this storm was an incredible forecast issue, by the way as was the second storm. And we did better with this one than the second storm. So there's still forecast issues here. But this is what it looked like. Um, what is really remarkable, first of all, is how much precipitation uh, this event dropped. Uh, this is a 48-hour precip map. And um, just from this storm alone, there was three to four feet of snow uh, just uh, north of DC. And then you throw the second one on top of that. And this really, really did shut the place down. Now, how did we do? Uh, what's this 8 to 14 day outlook at a CPC? Uh, they're actually, if you look at the discussions with this, they actually talked about the potential for, a, um, for storm events up and down the coast. We don't, at this time frame, don't give specific dates. The 6 to 10 day outlook is consistent with that. And, and this particular storm had a, a level of predictability that really was incredible. I mean, you know, right off of that uh, Pacific jet uh, that was probably El Nino influenced. And um, you look at the, uh, haz uh, the hazard assessment and um, the heavy snow event for the mid-Atlantic state is emphasized. One of the things I like to do um, for these events is just go through the forecast. Now, what you're seeing on the left-hand side is the analysis 
The right-hand side is what comes out of HPC uh, on the medium range test. And they look at all the models. And they're increasingly looking at the ensembles. If you read their discussions, it used to be the model of the day kind of a discussion. And now it's, it's really ensemble uh, influenced, if not em uh, emphasized. So there's seven, six. Again, there was a timing issue. Five, four, three, two, one. Now, in the early 70s, we couldn't do this even 24 hours, at, um, especially with secondary cyclogenesis, where you have something that's dying out here and forming up here. And Ramage, writing that paper in the bulletin as a godson, he, he advised us to, to abandon all efforts in numerical modeling for this kind of uh, prediction. Okay? And he used East Coast cyclogenesis as a reason for abandoning models, because there was no way we would be able to get to secondary cyclogenesis. And here we are doing it seven days in advance. And I have to tell you that when you start looking at where people were taking action, uh, we have a winter weather desk uh, spun up in the uh, HydroMet Prediction Center. We do probabilistic forecasts off of that. And I'm sure they do it in categories, greater than 4, greater than 8, greater than 12. Three days prior, this is the first time in the history of that desk that they had a 70% probability for heavy snow greater than 12 inches three days in advance. And then you look at two days prior and then one day prior. And they had a very tight northern boundary on this. Again, in this case, the northern boundary was handled relatively well. In the second case, we, we certainly had problems in New England. And if you, on that map, which I am, I'm one of the, what is it, two, three hundred people on that map address, a lot of emails flying around about what to do about the northern edge. So clearly they got it. When they look at the total amount of precip, uh, this is a 48-hour uh, precip map off of the medium range desk, which doesn't account for the early, there's a slight mismatch in time, so they don't have this part here. But clearly, we were going for a very heavy uh, precip event associated with this. OK, so what's behind these forecasts um, and all the forecasts we'll make? What I've done here is attempt, I think people have seen this seamless suite of products with the idea that as there's forecast uncertainty in all the forecasts that you make. And theoretically, you like to think that as you approach an event, the uncertainty um, gets smaller and smaller. When you get into a warnings and alert, you know, basically your uncertainty is going to zero, at least in terms of the way users make decisions based on warnings. You know, when we do a warning now, there's a whole sequence of uh, decisions that are made and people taking action. And what I've highlighted here are the modeling systems mapped against this. And in blue, um, this is the CFS, the climate, the North American ensemble forecast system, which is a combination of our models plus the Canadians. And by the end of this summer, we'll have the Finmock model. So this will be a three-model, multi-model ensemble. We have the Schreff here. And you're seeing we're becoming increasingly dominated by ensemble-based systems. We have different hurricane models that we can run, but they're not run as an ensemble yet. So we, have, we don't have blue here. And that's going to be one of the challenges for the DTC. So this, this, this suite of models is becoming increasingly multi-model. Um, um, and, and I can tell you that the forecasters are increasingly using it, including the forecasters in the uh, local offices who have done an incredible job in collecting information. And you, know, you look at Rich Grum's discussions, and he does case studies on these ensembles, you know, the week of the event. So it's, it's really remarkable how this is permeating. Now, when you, you lay out the models this way, you know, we're, we're all interested in the regional model, the short range ensemble model, the severe weather models here, um, which already have WARF. Now, we're, we're running, we support and run both cores within the short range ensemble forecast. We run the uh, very high res of at least for us operationally, in that four to five kilometer range. Um, we also support the workstation wharf, both cores. And these are run at local offices. And if you trace the back, the initial and boundary conditions, you go right back into the global forecast system here. So if you look at this from left to right, all forecasts start with observations. We have 1.7 billion observations a day, most of them uh, satellite. We run them through the GSI for uh, global data assimilation. It runs the GFS. Uh, this drives initial and boundary conditions for our regional models. And this model drives initial and boundary conditions for these models. 
Uh, this will uh, shortly go to a WARF-based system. They're looking to go to a WARF-based system as well. So WARF is certainly permeating the operational model stream. Uh, it is. Oh, 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 I didn't uh, shade it. Shade it. Right, right. <laughs> tough, tough crowd. <laughs> now, India, I just got back from India. Give me a break. <laughs> All right, so the, the computing capability here, I, I'm just putting this out. I think everybody's, you know, we, we have a primary system at Gaithersburg. We have a backup system at Fairmont. Our users are telling us that, that the degraded backup we had in the late 90s, early 2000 time frame, we're not, it's not good enough. So we have a 15-minute switch over. We actually can do it in six. Um, we've just gone over to the Power 6. Um, it was a factor of four increase over the IBM Power 5. Um, and if you look at the on-time delivery out of our system, you, you don't even see these blips anymore, even during our transition period. And I have to tell you that this is what our customers are telling us that on time, all the time, is the most important parameter that they're interested in. You know, if we were back in these days here, with this kind of performance, NSEP would be out of business, okay? The uh, web access has become a huge way for uh, users to get into our system as the model is running. The good old days, you know, when you're hanging over fax machines, you had to wait, you know, two hours after the model for post-processing you know, that you can't afford that anymore. And these spikes are all winter. So I have a, I do have a now a number basis a, 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 for my winter bias in my whole career. Um, the customer base actually supports it. Okay, I've got this in here. Um, so keep that in mind. The real time all the time is a huge challenge. It's a model engineering challenge as much as it is a model science challenge. Another aspect is um, NSEP has just been reviewed. Uh, it's a, actually an incredible review process that was done under the UCAR. And we're, are, you know, we're sorting through all the reviews. We had all the centers reviewed and, and get the response back. And I got to tell you, it'll be a very, a very um, uh, intense uh, response that we're going to use that review to move the uh, organization forward. But one of the aspects is, you know, how closed is EMC, okay? I mean, be blunt, all right? And, it's, and what I'm pointing out here is, is that we've done an audit of the code that runs on the operational system today. And, and it's about 70, per, when you add all, this, all these lines up, it comes out about 70% of the code originated from outside of NSEP. Now, the, the thing is, is that's another model engineering aspect, because there are people who don't want one line of code changed. And if it adds too much time to the run, it, they're not going to get in. We, had, uh, we have this fast forward radiative transfer system uh, in our data simulation that there were people that got at Space Flight Center wouldn't allow us to use their part of the code, because we would have to change that code to make it fit within the time. But they wrote papers on that code. And they didn't want it, so it didn't go in, OK? So this is another aspect of the model engineering to keep in mind. OK, WARF. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm not being too defensive here. Um, I wasn't in the original meetings, but I know Bob Gall was, Bill Quo was, I think Jeff Demago. It was done under Ron McPherson's watch. And I know that uh, Rick had, you know, the UCAR president was involved in this. Um, I, I consider it a, uh, a success story, despite uh, how tough it is. Joe Clem still here? Is Joe here? Uh, he, I told him I was going to declare it a, a success. I think maybe I scared him off. Um, <laughs> we've been at meetings where we have to start off by trying to explain why it failed. Okay, it was, initial, it was initiated in the late 90s. It was initially envisioned as a single model core. Okay, we're all going towards the run of the day. Now, something happened in the late 90s, and it's called ensembles. And it was called multi-model ensembles. And I have to tell you, it, it caught us all, I think. Um, you can go into the requirement statements for the models that we've been running, I mean, for the computers that we've been running off the last 10 years. The word ensemble does not appear in any of those requirements. They were written in the mid-90s. 
the two words data assimilation also doesn't appear, which is why we've had this issue about how do we fit in the data assimilation and ensembles at the same time. And there are cultural issues. You can go back, you can read stuff in the 40s and 50s about the gulf between the research and operational communities, and Tepper has some really great description of it. It was, it was almost like a war uh, back then as the modeling effort was introduced. And it really wasn't until the mid-80s that the forecasters really started accepting uh, numerical models as a basis for making a forecast. So the emphasis shifts to multi-model ensembles for all applications. This was occurring at the same time. And we had work done in Norman uh, in the Hazardous Weather Testbed that certainly pointed to this. And what I was getting from that directly was don't choose between the two cores. Run them both, even for severe storm applications, which was completely opposite of what I was hearing from the Europeans, by the way, who were saying that the ensembles would not have any influence on short-term prediction. It was all medium range out to long range. So that's what we decided to do. Um, now, I'll just mention the, the, the recent Shref and how, where we're going with this, and it takes time. This is not a switch. There's not a light switch that says, okay, we're going to go from one system to the next. So we have version 4.0 implemented in October um, of this uh, past year. Uh, we increased the resolution for the regional spectrum model, the WOF NMM, uh, and the WOF ARW. Um, we added four more WOF members and subtracted four ADA members. So we're shifting this over towards a WOF-dominated um, uh, system. We expect this, either the next implementation or the implementation after that, that the ADA will be completely gone. This is the last vestige of the ADA within our operational runs. And then we've done all this post-processing activities uh, for uh, better applications. And um, I can tell you, at least the feedback I'm getting from the forecasters, is that the SHRAF is increasingly becoming the model system of choice for days one through three. Okay, now the DTC, and, and now keep this in mind, we do not have that kind of capability for the hurricane forecast uh, today. All right, so the DTC uh, was initiated in the late 2000 um, time frame. Uh, this is, I consider this the principal link between the research and operational communities. Uh, Jack Hayes, who was the direct, was uh, Don's, no, he was Greg's predecessor, and then Don, so uh, director of OST, myself, really just strategically said, we have to have the DTC. And by the way, I believe strategically, and I've said this within NOAA, that the DTC has to be managed outside of NOAA, or it re reduces its credibility. So I've been a strong proponent of having the DTC within NCAR. Exactly where within NCAR is for NCAR to decide, okay? But it's got to be outside of NOAA. Um, you have code modification, you have the training, you have the research utilization of operational code. And I think that this is a key part of what I, you know, I've come to uh, understand in terms of R2O, that you can't do research to operations effectively unless the research community is using the operational code. Now, that doesn't mean that everything that's done on research models can't be, it just takes longer. Okay, it's just going to take longer if you're not using the operational infrastructure to do the research. And by the way, this is what they do in Europe. This is the European model that I say, is that people do the research uh, using the operational code. It's historically been underfunded, so we've been running on vapor for too long. Uh, but we did get uh, new programmatic funds uh, in 2009 and now 2010. So I think we're really ready to start cooking here. So we got a new director, Bill Quo. Uh, we've, signed, we've signed a multi-agency agreement. Uh, there's new NOAA funding. Um, I think this is the first time, maybe I'm wrong here, but it's the first time in history that Boulder Research and Camp Springs Operation support the same mesoscale model code. I think that's big. Uh, the operational uh, infrastructure is being made available for the research community from data to model verification. And the focus on the hurricane forecast improvement program gener has generated the uh, the resource support, and it's pointed towards a very important forecast issue, as everybody saw, uh, you know, over the last five years. So the challenges, there are many challenges. We have the standard infrastructure. I don't know how many times Greg and I, you know, wound up in a meeting where we're saying, you know, what is this, 
you know, how are you going to force this into an infrastructure? But if you have a standard infrastructure, it just makes it easier for the model engineers to make this work operationally and keep us within these very strict time restraints. Uh, the multi-model ensemble. I don't know what the answer is. I mean, Cliff Mass will come up and say, model diversity doesn't mean two cores. Okay? And I've had uh, Don Johnson and others come up to me and say, don't underestimate what the dynamic cores bring to model diversity. I'm not making that decision. Okay? So, go at it. You know? Just go at it. So, what, is it, what does it mean? Or does it mean both? And, and oh, what's the optimal resolution when you run it? What's the optimal number? I need to know that. I'm the one who's got to go out and get computers to run these things operationally. I can't go do a random walk and say, I've got to run 100 runs every six hours. I'm going to get blown out. So I need to have that information. Data assimilation. We have a multi-agency plan that's being worked out right now between Ezreal, Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, and us. Uh, working towards this whole thing about 40 VAR and some common filtering, both hybrid, okay? Let's go at it. Sometimes, some things work better for regional than global. Sustaining O2R, focusing research in R2O and high priority society, and this end to end challenge. Sometimes it's not the model. And I just want to point out this model dropout stuff. That's a dropout, okay? It's not the six hippies working on this project, okay? This is what, this is, kills you. If you're trying to catch up with somebody and you get one of these events and the old European center is staying up here, you don't have a snowball's chance in hell. Now, the guy who was telling me this was Tony Hollingsworth. Right? And, he, and I, I, the last conversation I had with him was on this topic. And I swore that after, you know, his sudden passing away that I was going to get personally involved in this. And we, we were getting one a month. You know, it was just awful. We've got a whole bunch of people working on this. This is the last, this is the last from, you know, I w this part of my daily brief, I go to this chart, okay? Because, you know, first of all, we're, we're comparing scores. For, we used to be 50 points behind. We're, we're in this 30 range here. No dropouts. Now, every time I show this to Steve Lord, he freaks because he says, I'm going to jinx it. The other thing... The other thing here is, you know, look at the scatter you have in the Southern Hemisphere. So there are things happening in the Southern Hemisphere not happening in the Northern Hemisphere, but, you know, no dropouts. We are keeping track of these things. Notice the, um, notice the large number we were having. The, the red is Southern Hemisphere, blue is Northern Hemisphere. We haven't had any um, Northern Hemisphere since November. Now, what is it? What are we doing? We're doing stuff like station dictionary, looking at the calibration of satellite data, the checking the data bins, all this quality control drudge grunt work, all right? Asymmetric satellite. We're finding that if your data has biases and you oversample, you're in trouble. Wow, where did we learn that before, okay? We're relearning it here. And I have to tell you, the European Center, where we're looking at some of their algorithms, they have invested a lot of time and money on this kind of stuff. And we're using it. We're right now looking at aircraft quality control issues in the southern hemisphere. You see all that chatter? You got, you got data that's 30 days old going in as real-time data. We got people now discovering that, okay? Um, so this is the kind of grunt work you get involved in when you're trying to catch up. Okay. Um, I believe WARF is more of a success than a failure. I think we're actually ahead of the curve on multi-model ensembles for the regional short-range prediction. And if we hadn't done WARF, we would just, we, we'd be arguing uh, rather than actually doing this every day and showing what works and what doesn't. Um, we're doing mesoscale deterministic forecasts. We've got shreff based MME, and we've got workstation versions for WFOs. There are many challenges remain. God knows we have many challenges. I mean, the review is about that thick, okay? Um, Rick, is that available? We've made that readily available right now. I don't believe you've signed off on the final edited version yet. Okay, because we've still got two centers that are, okay. But my, my view is I want to get it out. I'm not trying to sit on it. We'll get it out, and we're going to get our response to it out as well. Um, we have a goal. We want, we want viable vigorous test beds in every center. We got two 
working with EMC, we got the DTC, we got the Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation, also run you know, by somebody outside of NOAA, that's Lars Rishnagard, et cetera, et cetera. And the building, I showed this in India, by the way, and all they pointed to was the cloud over the building. I thought it was a beautiful picture. <laughs> all I could say, it's tied up in the courts. I'm actually spending more time learning about bankruptcy proceedings. The, uh, the main, the main uh, contractor won, won Chapter 7, unfortunately, so we're trying to work that out. It's a complicated story, and I'll talk to you about it over wine tonight. That's it. Thank you.